longer life um, due to more opportunities to reproduce for a species. Um, I have made up my own amateur theories, but uh, seeing as I respect you so much, I was wondering uh, how is it in your opinion that death-related adaptations are passed on, specifically the surge of happy chemicals, so to speak, that put animals in a state of relaxation as they die? Well, um, that's an interesting question. It's one that I had never thought of before. Um, if it's true that there is a surge of happy chemicals that puts animals into a happy state when they die, um, I presume you mean something like a gazelle, the moment when the lion's jaws close on it, um, has a happy surge. Is that what you mean? Um, no. <laughs> um, I mean, like, uh, even in human beings, people saying near-death experiences, they get these exhilarating feelings. and. Uh, like dopamine, uh, rush to the brain. Um. Well, I must say I look forward to that. <laughs> searching too assiduously for a Darwinian explanation for that phenomenon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Hi, Dr. Dawkins. This is Troy Boyle. I'm the uh, president of the National Atheist Party. And, uh, I find happening in debates on Facebook and online and, and anywhere else that theists and atheists uh, come to loggerheads is one that I like to typify by saying that it seems at the end of all debate that the theist is happier with what they consider to be their emotional truth rather than an objective or scientific standard for truth. And I'm curious how you would address uh, that, that dichotomy. I've noticed something similar. Um, you will sometimes hear people say, oh, well, in my life quest, I tried uh, Buddhism, but that didn't seem quite right for me. And then so I thought I'd try Christianity. And, um, well, Christianity was all right, but I didn't fi find it all that uh, consoling. And then I tried Judaism. And it's as though what they're seeking, what they're seeking is what makes them feel good, rather than what's true. And um, I can't get my head around that. I mean, it seems to me that um, the fundamental propositions of religions are existence propositions. They're propositions about the way things are. Either there is a God or there isn't. Either Jesus is the Son of God or he wasn't. Um, either, uh, either Muhammad was a holy prophet or he wasn't. Um, and so, whether people's feelings are tickled by a particular religion, whether they feel happy because of their belief in God, is absolutely irrelevant to the question of whether God is true. And um, I cannot bring myself to overcome my desire to know what's true in order to just be, be cheerful. Um, so, um, I, think it, I think it might have been Bertrand Russell who told the story of, of, a, of, of a woman who, who wrote to him and said, no, it wasn't Bertrand Russell, I think it was, it, it was somebody else. She said, I accept the universe. And he said, by Gadgie, better. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I also want to point out that I prefer the magic of reality, too. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Dr. Dawkins, I appreciate you being here today. Um, so, I guess when you were talking about there was never really a first human being, I was following your points, um, but I also kind of brought up questions of identity for me. Um, <laughs> If there was no, uh, it's kind of a three-part question, so hang with me. If there was no first person, what am I? Um, how do we judge the innate value of a human if each
each person is quote unquote more advanced than the previous generation. And does this, how should we interpret this with, um, with races? What an excellent question. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. There, what it means is that there was no first person, and you are, you are wrong to even try to draw a line around the species Homo sapiens and to say that there is a unique humanness which separates um, humanity from all other from all other species. If you think about it, the very idea of there being a separation between humanity and all other species is deeply unevolutionary. Um, it's rather like trying to judge the moment when, a, when an embryo becomes human, the, mo the moment of conception or three weeks after conception or whatever it is. It's a nonsensical question. And it's even more nonsensical in the evolutionary sphere because it, it, is, it, it really is true that there never was a sudden moment when in the generation of our ancestors you could say, right, this, these parents were not human, this child is human. It never happened. Now the reason why it's possible for us to construct a system of law, a system of morality, which is species-based, which singles out humanity for unique treatment and treats all other species differently, the reason why we can get away with that is the accident of history that the intermediates happen to be extinct. If the intermediates were still around, and imagine as a thought experiment that Somewhere in the African jungle, explorers discover a whole series of intermediates between humans and chimpanzees, so close to each other that it's possible to interbreed with them in a continuous daisy chain all the way from us to chimpanzees. Thus, thus I can mate with, with A, who can mate with B, who can mate with C, who can mate with D, who can mate with a chimpanzee and produce fertile offspring all the way. Now, that has got to be in principle possible if only the intermediates hadn't happened to go extinct. If we could only reach out in a time machine and bring those intermediates back to life, then it would be possible to construct <coughs> such a daisy chain of interbreeding, fertile interbreeding, all the way between us and chimpanzees, um, and which, would, which would mean that, that the only way to, um, to come to a point about race, it means that the only way to um, to accept our species' law and ethics would be to have ludicrous courts of law, rather like they did in South Africa, um, where they had courts of law to decide whether uh, people were black or counted as white. You could have, you could have, you would have to have courts of law to decide whether such and such an individual counts as human. So, so the, our, our human-centered ethics, our human-centered human morality, uh, which pervades almost all of religious morality that I'm aware of, is entirely based upon the accidental fact that the intermediates in evolution happen to be dead. Thank you. Thank you. try to locate intelligent life elsewhere. Do you agree why or why not? <laughs> well, no, um, because um, well, I mean, he, what, he's, what he's worried about is that it will call attention of extraterrestrial beings to our existence, and they might come and, 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 and eat us or something. <laughs> but um, in order for that to happen, they would have to be close enough to reach us. And I made the point earlier that um, the speed with which bodies can physically move is so much slower than the speed with which radio signals can move that I think we're probably pretty safe to allow um, evidence of our existence to radiate outwards. And I think also we're, it's probably worth the money, by the way, to be doing the opposite, SETI, um, listening with parabolic dishes, listening for signals from elsewhere. Good evening, Dr. Hopkins. Audience. Um, uh, as 
Christopher Hitchens likes to say, if you would uh, kind enough to permit me to clear my throat for a few seconds here. <clears throat> As it's not every night, Richard Dawkins is in Richmond, Kentucky. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Benjamin, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin once advised, write something worth reading or do something worth being written about. It must be very satisfying then to know I've accomplished both. After giving Darwin a second wind and Hamilton's idea of wings to fly, you spearhead the movement to raise the consciousness of the world. You're nothing if not ambitious. Uh, the Jefferson said, enlighten the people generally, <clears throat> excuse me, enlighten the people generally in tyranny and oppression of body and mind will vanish. I do have a question. And indeed, sir, in my own life, the change in my youth of fear, guilt, shame, with their imaginary flowers have never been, <clears throat> have been broken that I may now embrace the living cloud. Uh, to borrow from Thoreau, I built my castle in the sky. Its name was Cognitive Dissonance, but without the persistent efforts of yourself and others like you, building that foundation for it, I might never have moved in. Uh, you have my profound gratitude. My question is, generations from now, when perhaps some of us in attendance are going through the history of scientific thought with our grandchildren, uh, just in case, as Kipling put it, uh, the truth you've spoken gets twisted by names to make a trap for fools. Uh, what specifically should we tell them? <clears throat> Was the great hope and intention of Richard Dawkins on the night that we all had the uh, great pleasure of attending his lecture in Richmond, Kentucky? Thank you. Goodness. Right. <laughs> on the spur of the moment, not having had time to prepare as thoroughly as you have the question. Um, I would say that I would look forward to a time when all children are brought up to think for themselves, are taught to, to believe things only when they hear evidence for it, and are taught to mistrust authority, tradition, uh, revelation, faith, and just rejoice in being in the real world and rejoice in having a brain which is capable of apprehending the real world, not just with our senses, but with all the faculties of scientific thought, so that they will grow up having as full an appreciation as possible of the universe into which they happen to have been born and of the uh, history of events that led them to be here. Because that is a wonderful state to be in. And it's a state that can be reached and in the 21st century already we are in a very good position to, to reach it. But unfortunately it's denied to a very large number of people.